Great. So I'm Ewan Wallace, the project manager for Northern Devon Natural Solutions, uh, a Devon Wildlife Trust project supported by the Environment Agency and Devon County Council. It's focusing on delivering targeted environmentally and wildlife sensitive farm advice in 36 water bodies across the Torrance Bridge. Aside from the somewhat clunky project name, uh, we can use NDNS from now on. Uh, NDNS is looking to foster an atmosphere of collaboration amongst farmers uh, and also between farmers and the Wildlife Trust and between communities of the Wildlife Trust. All this can bring benef benefits for agriculture, communities, the environment and for wildlife. Bokashi is a great example of a nature-based solution and that's something I'm often asked to divine what is a nature-based solution uh, and the, uh, the problem that we need a solution to in this instance is how to manage your animal waste, be it farmyard manure, slurry and so forth. And a solution, and this is one that enhances natural processes, is Bakashi, reasons that will be covered uh, by this webinar. The presentation is going to be given by Andrew Simcock, Commercial Director of Agriton, a company that manufactures and markets environmentally sensitive and wildlife friendly products for the agricultural, horticultural and home and garden sectors. Several of these products relate to the Bakashi method of composting. I won't go into detail on that as Andrew is obviously far more qualified than I. I was introduced to Bakashi and Andrew last year when he came to a small farm in Northern Devon that I was running. A colleague arranged the visit and I was somewhat skeptical of the whole thing. It all sounded a bit far-fetched and I couldn't quite get my head around how it would work with our farmyard manure. Uh, that skepticism quickly gave way to interest and then that gave way to something bordering on evangelism about the benefits that using Bakashi could bring to the farm. And actually in this instance, Bakashi is also used for processing, one of the things used for processing food waste from a pub, but that's a, a wholly different webinar to we against that now. The greatest benefits that I can see for farming are really quite clear, significantly reducing pollution, decreasing the time it needs to stay in a heat before it can be spread and cutting the time it takes for the spread manures to break down in the field. It's far more complex than that, but that's the sort of, that, that's the simple way that I look at it. Uh, anyway, Andrew will, I'm sure, be able to give you a much better understanding of the benefits and how it works. So, Andrew, over to you. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. much. I like that. So, I'm just going to share my screen. If there's any problems, please shout. But hopefully, you guys can all now see my first slide. Are you making the most of your muck? Uh, quite a topical question. Uh, something that's gained a lot of traction, certainly in the last 12, 18 months, uh, but even more so recently with the, the increase in nitrogen price, um, as well as obviously the carbon footprint, carbon calculators, uh, and all the pressure that, that farmers, landowners, growers, uh, animal husbandry uh, farmers will be well aware of. So what we're hoping to achieve today is to provide you with a real insight into what you could possibly do differently to improve, first and foremost, your farming enterprise, but also to improve your, your sort of place in the environment. So trying to reduce pollution, emissions, uh, retain nutrients, reduce your reliance on inputs, um, to, to, to end up with a, uh, the, the term that I quite like to use at the moment is a resilient farming enterprise. And I think that, that Bakashi has a role to play. But what I will say as a bit of a disclaimer to start with, and, and something that I feel a lot more people should say is, there is no silver bullet. There is no one thing that you as, as farmers and landowners can do to you know, reduce prevent, stop global warming and, and all, the, all the sort of risks associated with it. There are lots and lots of tools at your disposal, but none of them are a silver bullet. And, and I hopefully by the end of this sort of uh, presentation, you'll realize that this is, this is another tool available to you that you can use moving forward to try and help you create a more sustainable, regenerative, environmentally friendly, all of those buzzwords um, but ultimately, you know, a, a profitable uh, and sustainable farming enterprise. So just a really quick little bit about us as an organization. Um, obviously, as mentioned previously, I work for Agriton. 
and Agriton started 27 years ago now in the Netherlands. And over that time, it's slowly been growing and now features in a number of different countries. Uh, a few even that aren't mentioned on this list, like Ireland, Poland. Um, there's a lot of, lot of traction for the products, a lot of traction for the, the conversations that we're having. So over that last 26, 27 years, the, the company's really grown into, into something that, that hopefully is, is here to stay for the long term and, and can provide some real, real world benefits to, to all, of, all, all of our customers. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about us. Obviously, I'm based in the UK, but we do work closely with the other countries. Uh, I call them sort of cousins, if you will. So we do share a lot of information back and forth. So there's projects that are going on in Sweden or, or Iceland um, that are relevant to us in the UK. And we've got all that knowledge and, and available to us and we can share that with you. So you get a real idea of what's happening around not just Europe, but also the world as well. So this is me. Uh, standing in a muck heap, knee deep in that instance. Uh, and this is how I spend an awful lot of my time at the moment, is, is talking to, communicating with, with farmers and, and interested parties to try and understand what's happening in the fields, what's happening with their muck and how they can improve things. And, and as I said, this isn't a silver bullet, but it might just improve your farming enterprise by two, three, four percent. And if you can do that on a number of different areas, you know, very quickly, your farming enterprise is going to be 10, 20 percent more efficient, uh, which is going to be good news for everybody. But this is this is definitely how I seem to spend most of my time. Uh, I have a have a nice shirt on today, but usually it's wellies, jeans and a, an off jumper. Uh, and I can get quite smelly at times. So what are we trying to do as a company, as an organization? What are my beliefs? Why am I why am I here today talking to you? Um, and it, it's really, really quite simple in, in my mind. It doesn't matter what type of farmer you are or landowner you are, whether you're arable, whether it's livestock. And I'm going to assume being generally North Devon today that the majority of people are, are livestock farmers. But it doesn't matter what type of farmer you are. The foundation of your farm is the soil. That's the very foundation upon which every single farming enterprise is built. If you don't have soil, you don't have fields. If you haven't got fields, you've not got crops, you've not got livestock. You know, the soil is the foundation of everything. And that cycle from what comes out of the soil, the crops that we're growing, whether it's grass or whether it's arable crops, that's all based on the soil. Then we're feeding our animals. Um, but the missing link that, that I feel we've, we've kind of forgotten about since probably Second World War, when the emergence of, of ammonium nitrate became available, is, is that waste. What are we doing with the waste? How are we managing that waste to best serve the soil, which is the most important aspect of every single farm in the UK uh, and around the world? So that cycle is the, fun, the foundation of everything we do. Uh, and it's something that since I've been working with Agroton uh, is, is really sort of been hammered home to me. And, and I now sort of appreciate and understand the importance that, that the soil has on every single farming enterprise and, and everything that we do on farm we should have in the back of the mind is okay if I'm feeding my cow this or feeding my crops this what's the knock-on effect to that next chain in that cycle so what are we applying onto our crops and then how is that affecting the animals that, that we are feeding or even the humans us ourselves the, those crops that we consume what is our effect? And then how are we treating that waste to complete that cycle? And I think if we can, we can take a step towards completing that cycle, then, then you know, regenerative agriculture, that term that everybody uses, um, you know, we're one step closer and, and we're working with nature. You know, everything in nature is about cycles and, and it's only humans that seem to have disrupted that, that cycle. So, the, the question and the reason why everybody's here is, is regarding the muck. So why is organic manure so important? What is it? Why am I here? Why are we talking? Why are you listening? Um, and I think it's because you, you've understood or realized or appreciate that organic manure has a value. It absolutely has a value. And the way in which we manage it is important and can make a difference to that value. And I think that's the key point is, is the management of these manures can make a real difference to, to your farm profitability at the end of the day. So that's what we're talking about. That's what today will be about. 
But the first thing I want to, to try and show you and, and, and sort of um, reiterate, if you will, is that organic manures um, and farms in general are responsible for not all, but they are responsible for some greenhouse gas emissions. And this was this was taken from a, a DEFRA document looking at the amount of emissions lost and, and the main contributors. And I think when you look at the, the main three, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide and methane, the first thing that, that springs to my mind is carbon, nitrogen and energy. So these emissions that we on farm are emitting, carbon, nitrogen and, and energy, are, are causing pollution. You know, in these instances, it's volatilizing or, or volatilizing nitrogen, for example, and then being released into the atmosphere. But it could be leaching from uh, FYM heaps or uh, an, a slurry tank that's overfilling, or overflowing, sorry, into the watercourse. These emissions are all a form of pollution. But one step further, these emissions, this pollution is also losses from our farm. Carbon dioxide, carbon, we are losing carbon from our farm. And we want carbon on our farm. We want carbon in our soils. The more carbon we have in our soils, the healthier, more fertile our soils will be. Nitrous oxide, that's lost nitrogen. Again, where do we want nitrogen? We want nitrogen in our soils. We don't want to be losing it into the atmosphere. And methane is, is a great source of energy. It's why we have anaerobic digestion plants to capture that energy to generate uh, electricity for us. So there's an awful lot of losses that are happening on farm. And you can look at them a number of different ways. Some people will call them emissions. Some people will call them pollutions. Uh, but I think we need to realize that that's losses. That's nutrients that we had on our farm that we no longer have. And they've disappeared. And once they've gone, unfortunately, there's no way of returning them. They, they have been lost forever. So we're having to replace them. Uh, the next slide that we can see here, and I think there's a little bit of a delay, so hopefully you can see it and, and are keeping up with me, um, are a picture of two FYM heaps on farm, one on concrete, one in a field. Now, we cannot physically see the emissions being lost into the atmosphere from these heaps, but we can see the nutrients being lost uh, on the left, on the concrete yard, that that's wandering off down into the road. And on the right, those nutrients are being taken into the soil and they will be working their way down through that soil profile and they will eventually end up in a watercourse. So in both these instances, we cannot see any volatilization or losses into the atmosphere, but we can still see losses. And that's nutrients, soluble nutrients in this instance that have been washed away as those heaps have been rained on. So every time there's, there's a little bit of rain and we're in the Southwest, so we get a plenty of rain you will be losing soluble nutrients that have a value to you and can be used to grow the next crop or feed the soil, um, they're being lost. Unfortunately, in most instances, when it comes to, to the leaching or, or effluent runoff, it's ending up in water courses and having a significant, significantly negative effect and impact on, on sort of local wildlife and biodiversity within, within those natural habitats. Something that we're not necessarily directly responsible for, um, but something that we all enjoy looking at, seeing from day to day. You know, I'm, I'm a keen walker and I enjoy the countryside an awful lot. I don't enjoy stepping across a little stream that's, that's more slurry than it is water. So if we can take, a, take some action and try and reduce these, we're gonna be in a lot better position, both financially, but also environmentally as well. Another loss that is possibly less, um, less noticeable in regards to the amount of nutrients that we're losing, um, but actually probably has the greatest impact on farm. And that's the loss of our topsoil. These images were, were taken by myself uh, in the last couple of years. Um, some of them in, in Devon. In fact, two of the three pictures were taken in Devon. And, and you can see that they're having a real impact on the, the fields in question. You know, there's an awful lot of soil being lost. Um, on that soil and attached to that soil are nutrients. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, 
zinc, boron, molybdenum, all of our nutrients that we are replacing with bagged fertilizer or, or bottled nutrients um, are just washing away through, through the field gate into watercourses and having a significant knock-on impact. It's one of the reasons why the farming uh, rules for water came into place. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it happens far too often. Now, in most instances, it's usually management, um, but it's all part of the bigger picture, which is, is soil health and completing that cycle. If we can keep hold of those nutrients, keep hold of those, uh, that energy, that topsoil, we're going to have a better, more resilient farming enterprise. We're going to have better quality soil that's more resilient to weather conditions. It can hold on to more moisture during wet winter months, but also release more moisture during the, the drier summer months because it's like a sponge. It doesn't disappear. It will stay there, can release it slowly over time. If we can take steps to trying to improve our soils, we're going to be in a lot better position moving forward into the future. And, and that's really, really important, especially in the last sort of six months when the cost of inputs has increased as much as it has. Um, fertilizer, fuel prices, energy prices and, and feed have all been rising. They're all increasing. And unfortunately, there's absolutely nothing we as farmers, growers, landowners can do about it. Nothing. We are completely and utterly at the mercy of these input costs. So my suggestion would be, well, let's become less dependent on those input costs. Can we reduce the amount of fertilizer we um, need to apply to achieve the same sorts of yields? If we can, we can reduce some of our costs. We're in more, we have more control over those, those costs if we don't need to use them as much. Uh, and obviously that's easier said for, for some things than others. Um, but if we can look after our soils, if we can keep hold of more nutrients, we need to buy less fertilizers. We can potentially grow more of our own feed, use more of our own forage on farms to reduce having to buy in, buy in compound feed or straits. Um, unfortunately, there's not much we can do about the energy price unless we want to, to put up a, a huge great wind turbine or, or consider solar panels. Um, but there are steps we can take, and that's what we're trying to talk about today. And, and hopefully at, by the end of this, and I know I'm rambling on, uh, we'll have some practical solutions for you. So Bakashi, something that, that Ewan's touched on, and I thought he, he summarized it quite well. Um, the, the sort of sentence that we use and, and I've, I've sort of adopted is, is it's like compost, um, only better. And, and hopefully we can, we can delve into exactly why I think it's a little bit better than, than compost. And when I say compost, I mean traditional compost, so aerobic, where it's potentially turned, thermophilic composting, um, exposed to the oxygen, very much like a field FYM heap. So there's a sentence here, which I think, um, and, and usually I like to try and ask people and get some sort of involvement going on here, but slightly tricky. Microbes break down complex organic structures into their constituent parts to drive yield. That process is happening in the rumen and it's happening in the soil. Rumen microbes will break down feeds, so fiber, cellulose, into their constituent parts to drive yield, whether that be milk or meat. Microbes are breaking that down first. In the soil, the same thing's happening. Soil microbes are breaking down complex organic structures into their constituent parts to drive yield. The same process is happening in both the soil as well as inside the rumen. And I think the, the example and an old saying that I'm sure everybody's heard of is, is you feed the rumen, not the cow, um, is, is very apt in this point. When it comes to the soil, we are feeding the crop, not the soil. So we, although the same things are happening in both situations, the way in which we treat them is, is very, very different. And that's really quite obvious when we look at our silage analysis compared to a soil analysis. On the screen now on the left hand side, we've got a, a typical silage analysis. And on the right, we've got a, a, the minimum requirements for a soil analysis. Now, I'm sure you guys are the same as me. The first thing that I look at when I receive a, a, a soil analysis would be dry matter and energy. The two most important things when it comes to, to feeding an animal. How much am I feeding them and how much energy are we, we going to be providing them as well? 
So energy is a really important aspect when it comes to feeding livestock. Yet when we come to feed the soil, what do we look at? We look at pH, N, P, K, maybe calcium, manganese, all of those other trace elements. Nowhere do we consider our carbohydrates, our carbon. And that's a really important point that I think we're missing when it comes to, to how we feed the soil. We feed our animals, we even feed us as humans in calories, carbohydrates, carbon. Yet when we feed the soil, it's N, P and K. And there's a, there's a vid visual image here that I, I really like to use. And I think it's, it's quite, um, quite striking. On the left-hand side, we've got a nice juicy steak with some chips. On the right-hand side, we've, we've got some pills. On the right-hand side is how we feed the soil bagged fertilizers, bagged nutrients. On the left-hand side is how we feed ourselves and how we feed our animals. When we think about the soil, we've always thought about the N, P, K, the chemical uh, aspects of the soil. We never think about the microbial life within the soil and we need to feed that. Bagged fertilizer does not feed soil microbes. In fact, it has the opposite effect. It's extremely salty and it's probably the single worst thing you could do onto your fields in regards to soil health, soil biology. So the way in which we approach trying to feed the soil, uh, look after the soil um, and ensure that the soil is going to be working as efficiently as it can for us uh, needs to change. And, and this is probably the, the best visual that I can, can provide to try and get that mindset that you may be in um, to, to think about, hang on a minute, is this working for me? Can we do something a little bit differently uh, and achieve better, the same similar results without the same sort of environmental impact? Now, the easiest way to try and explain Bokashi and what Bokashi is and, and how it works is to get you guys to think about silage and silage making. Now, I'm, I'm hoping that everybody here and attending today has made or knows somebody or understands the process involved with, with making silage. What we're doing is we're cutting a crop and we're preserving it to feed later. And when everybody cuts their grass to make silage, they've got a choice of what they can do with it. And I think you'll find everybody, and I'd be amazed if anybody tells me otherwise, they all ferment it. They put it into a clamp they roll it, they squash all the oxygen out and they put a plastic sheet over the top of it to ferment that grass or that maize or that whole crop. They don't leave it in the corner of a field exposed to the oxygen because over a period of time, and it doesn't take all that long, that grass or, or that forage crop is going to heat up, is going to start to smell, it's gonna lose its nutrients and it's gonna lose all palatability. We do not cut forage crops and leave them in the corner of a field to rot. We bring them into the farm and we ferment them. And that's probably the simplest um, comparison that I can make to, to sort of try and explain it as simply as possible. The reason why we make silage is to retain nutrients, retain palatability and provide a food or a feed, sorry, um, in the winter months, keeping hold of those nutrients until we want to use them later. If we were to put those same nutrients in the corner of a field in a heap, they would all disappear. That wouldn't be any good for feeding ruminants six months later in the depths of the winter. Even if they were hungry, I don't think they'd munch their way through it. So why are we treating our organic manures differently? And the reason is, is we, we possibly haven't joined the dots up in our mind. We're aware of what's happening when we, we ferment silage but we don't think about it because it's a waste product. Humans have created this term waste or rubbish um, and, and therefore we treat it accordingly. You know, we think it's waste, we treat it like waste. Um, we don't do that with, with our grass or our maize um, because we're feeding it to a different animal. Yet we already know that the microbes in the room are very, very similar to the microbes in the soil. So we need to look at this and think about how can we, moving forward, provide the best feed stuff, not only for our animals, but also the army of microbes that are underneath your feet and that are growing the crops, the very crops that you're then feeding to those animals. So the term Bakashi 
is is an old Japanese term, and the closest translation that we can we can find is is fermented organic matter. Uh, so bakashi means fermented organic matter, and that's the anaerobic decomposition of organic matter to to create a nutrient dense, pre digested, microbially active food for the soil. Uh, hence my term like compost, only a bit better. Now, just a little bit on, on fermentation and, and anybody that's not sure exactly the, the science behind it, and I'm not going to get too technical, so don't worry. Um, but the fermentation is simply the breakdown of complex organic structures into their constituent parts. So here in front of us, if you take glucose, which is the, the black formula in the middle, C6, so six carbons, 12 hydrogens and six oxygen, that's one glucose molecule. If you bring several glucose molecules together, you create cellulose. And if you bring lots of cellulose molecules together, you end up creating lignin. And, and I've got the picture of the Lego there because I think that's a really nice visual in how to, to imagine that. So it's building things up, one glucose molecule, bring two or three together, you create cellulose, bring a few more together, you create lignin. So that's how things are being built up, but it's also how things are broken down. And we can do that when we ferment things. So lignin can be broken down into cellulose, which can be broken down into glucose, which is then obviously broken down into lactic acid and even acetic acid. These um, acids, organic acids, are what we call um, volatile fatty acids, which anybody that's feeding dairy cows will be aware about the volatile fatty acids, but they're the, cons the constituent parts. They're the building blocks of almost everything. Uh, so that's what's happening with the fermentation. It's, it's building up and then it's the breaking down. That breaking down is, is happening, that production of those organic acids, um, which is why something like uh, pickled onions, for example, vinegar is, is an organic acid. Um, and very good at preserving. There are other foods as well that we ferment. Uh, Greek yogurt, uh, whiskey, beer, uh, Tabasco sauce, Marmite. Um, there's a lot of fermented foods that we consume on a daily basis. But the main reason for the fermentation of, of foods, and it's something that we've been doing for hundreds of years, is to preserve these foods. The best way of preserving milk other than putting it into a fridge, is to converting it into, by fermenting it, sorry, and turning it into a yogurt. Um, so that's what's happening. It's the preservation of those nutrients for the long term, and that's achieved by fermentation. And this is, this is something that, that I still find quite difficult to believe, but it's something that, that is, is really, really relevant. And, and one of the best things about the fermentation process is 100 grams of milk contains 42 kilocalories. 100 grams of yogurt contains significantly more, yet they both have the same starting material. You know, 100 grams of milk is used then to make 100 grams of yogurt. A little bit of um, lactic acid bacteria will be used to ferment that milk and turn it into, into yogurt, but nothing else is being added, yet it contains more kilocalories. The reason for that is when we measure calories of any food stuff, we measure the calories that we as humans can consume. We don't measure the calories that we humans cannot consume. They will pass right through us. Our digestive systems can only access certain nutrients. What happens when we ferment milk? We introduce microorganisms and those microorganisms break apart different structures within that milk making more of it available to us. So those microbes are breaking apart some of the proteins and the fats that will be within that milk. And they're actually ending, the, the end result is that it's more available, there is more energy available to us as humans. So those microbes are pre-digesting the food. And by doing that, in this instance, they're actually increasing the nutritional value of that food. And, and a colleague of mine always says about this, if you were to eat barley, not much would happen. But if you drink lots of beer, and I can vouch for this, unfortunately, you get a bit of a stomach on you. And that's because there's an awful lot more energy available to us when you ferment that barley and make beer out of it. So if you don't want to get a bit of a beer belly, I would suggest drinking, uh, eating, sorry, raw barley instead, 
um, although I can guarantee you it won't taste quite as nice. So what's happening when we talk about the decomposition of organic matter? And, and I appreciate I'm jumping around a little bit, but I'm trying to give you the full picture of what we're trying to achieve, what we're trying to do. We've, we've worked out that there's pretty much four different types of decomposition. And, and anything that goes on in, in nature is, is a form of these, one of these, these four. On the far left, we've got aerobic synthetic microorganisms that are being used to break down organic matter. Now, the best example I can give of this would be leaves falling in a woodland, falling onto the ground, um, or for the keen gardeners that adopt a, a cut and drop approach where you've just got the crop residue on the surface over a period of time um, with the intake of external energy, i.e. the sun, the sun's light, the sun's rays and the sun's warmth, um, will break down that organic matter. And, and we call that aerobic fermentation. Next to that, we've got the aerobic decomposers, and that would be your typical composting. So that's an aerobic form where it's being turned regularly. And what's happening there is you're releasing some carbon, um, but at the end of it, you are creating a, you know, a nutrient dense food for the soil. It's got lots of nutrients and lots of goodness that's gonna benefit the soil. We've also got the, the useful zymogenic fermentation, uh, and that's the Bokashi process. And then on the far right, uh, and I can't see that behind my little screen, but we've got the harmful zymogenic fermentation, which is also known as putrefaction. So that's possibly the worst case scenario. Um, and an example of that would be in an anaerobic digester. We're deliberately creating a, a sort of less than ideal environment to promote the release of things like methane that in an anaerobic digester, we can then capture and use to generate energy. But in nature, where we have um, this putrefaction happening, those emissions are lost. Uh, and that's what's happening with, with things like landfill. We're releasing an awful lot of energy that we cannot capture, that we cannot use. But the key thing to take away here is it doesn't really matter what type of organic matter you apply onto the soil, you will be adding value. So if you're doing nothing currently and you're not using organic matter, um, it doesn't matter what form that organic matter is in, it's definitely gonna add value to the soil in the long run. And that's the key sort of message. It doesn't matter what you do, do something. To look at the, the aerobic decomposition in a little bit more detail, what we're trying to, to, to or what we're seeing here is that when we're turning organic matter regularly with a compost turner, for example, we can see that um, we're releasing a lot of heat and we're releasing a lot of carbon dioxide. And that's not ideal because we want that carbon dioxide and we want that energy in our soils. So traditional composting where it's being turned, um, it provides a nice, fibrous, fluffy end product that we can use, um, but it's not ideal. When we look at Bokashi, on the other hand, which is a fermentative process, we're not having that release of CO2. We're not losing the energy. What we're seeing is the production of amino acids. So as we mentioned earlier, those organic acids that are produced during that fermentation process, those are all preserving the nutrients within that organic matter that we've then bokashied. As well as that, we've also got secondary metabolites that are being produced by these microorganisms, and, and they will include vitamins and hormones and antibiotics and lots of beneficial um, sort of biogenic substances that can add value to the soil. And that's something that we don't really consider when we talk about what we're applying onto the soil. We just think about the organic matter and the nutrients within that organic matter. And what we're creating at the end of it is a, is a zymogenic soil, which, which means um, a fermentative soil and fermentative microbes are what we call facultative microbes. And I think a better term than, than zymogenic, which is probably a term that, that most people haven't heard of, would be resilient. You know, we're creating resilient soils, which means that depending on the conditions that they find themselves in, you know, in the wet months during the winter, the soil becomes more anaerobic. So we need soil microbes that can deal with that anaerobic environment 
but as it dries out and the soil becomes more aerobic, we need microbes that can also work and react and thrive in that aerobic environment. So there's a lot of conversation, a lot of talk, and I could do a whole webinar on, on different types of microorganisms. We need aerobic microbes, we need anaerobic microbes, and we need facultative microbes. You know, diversity, it always comes back to diversity. If you just have aerobic microbes in your soil, you've got a problem. If you've just got anaerobic microbes in your soil, you've also got a problem. You need a mixture of everything. And that's the key here is, is the Bakashi process because it's for cultivative microbes working in an anaerobic environment, producing an awful lot of primary and secondary metabolites. We end up with an end product that not only contains more in the way of nutrients, but it also contains a lot of beneficial um, sort of substances that are adding value to the microbial population but also having benefits on earthworms, dung beetles, nematodes, uh, the whole soil food web. So what exactly does all of this mean? What does it look like? And the easiest way to show you the sort of differences would, would be in the next two slides. So we've got a little, little graph here that we can see, and we can see that uh, the green line is traditional aerobic compost. So that's the composting that's being turned. We've also got the red line, which is the Bakashi process. And then we've got the ambient temperature, uh, the gray line. So what we can see is that very quickly we get an increase in temperature from, from composting. Now that increase in temperature is great if you're trying to achieve an aerobic decomposition. However, that temperature increase, that, that energy that's being used to generate that heat is energy that we could be putting into our soils to feed our soil biology, to feed the soil food web. If we're losing more energy than we keep hold of, we're losing an awful lot of value from our organic manures. The Cashy process remains cool, it's usually around the ambient temperature, I would say around 20 degrees is, is fairly typical. Um, and because it remains cool, we don't have the losses. You don't have that loss of energy that you would get with, with traditional composting. And we've all put muck heaps out in the corner of a field and we've all seen it two or three days or a week later or when the weather's a little bit cold, steaming. Uh, and that's lost energy lost nutrients, things that we could be putting into our soil. So it does make a difference. That heat, that temperature that you're achieving, 70 degrees is what everybody wants to achieve from, from really good compost, is, is nothing more than, than lost energy. You're just burning the organic matter. So what does that mean in more typical sort of uh, analysis results? What can we see? What can we expect from the end product? This was a trial that was done in the Netherlands uh, by the Feed Innovation Services, and they compared the two processes together. They had a starting material of 13.4 tonnes. And by the time that had been composted, that 13.4 tonnes became five tonnes. The Bakashi process slightly increased in total kilograms. That's because the amendments that we've added, which we'll touch on in a minute, um, but we can see that we've not lost anything in regards to the, the, the end product, the end weight of that material. Most importantly, and I've obviously got them circled there because they're the, the key ones, um, but just above the carbon total is organic matter. So two tons, just over two tons of organic matter by the time it had been composted was under 900 kilograms. So you'd lost 62% of the organic matter Whereas the Bakashi process, you've gone from 2.1 tons to just under 2.1 tons. You've experienced 3% losses. So the losses are significantly less. And the rough rule of thumb is that 50% of organic matter is, is carbon. We can see that one ton of carbon with traditional composting has resulted in just 441 kilograms of carbon being left compared to Bakashi, where you had over a ton left. So there was hardly any losses. Now, this is obviously quite a small quantity, but to put it into sort of terms and, and to, to try and put some real world spin on, on this, if you've got 100 tonnes of organic matter and you compost that with traditional composting methods, a turner, so you're turning it, introducing oxygen, 
you're going to lose roughly 60 tons of organic matter. And as we know, roughly 50% of that organic matter is going to be carbon. So 100 tons of organic matter is going to lose 30 tons of carbon. Now, if you convert that into CO2 equivalents, which is a method by which we measure these emissions that we're giving off, 100 tons of organic matter will release 111 kilograms of CO2. So you're actually giving off more CO2 in CO2 equivalents than you have organic matter, which is a very, very scary thought and a huge contribution towards our overall carbon footprint. Obviously, we've got to look at nitrogen. People want to talk about nitrogen. Uh, we see a slight increase in the nitrogen content of the organic matter. And that's because the microbes that we add are themselves made from proteins and proteins are roughly 16% nitrogen. So we're adding a little bit of nitrogen, but it's the makeup of that nitrogen that's very important. The microbes convert mineral nitrogen into organic nitrogen. So you can see there that the mineral nitrogen decreases in both traditional composting and the Bokashi compost, but the organic nitrogen is, is increasing in both instances. It's increased more in Bokashi because we've got more material, you've got more mass, you've got more area for those microbes to, to populate. So we're seeing a conversion of mineral nitrogen into organic nitrogen, and that results in the retention of more nitrogen compared to traditional composting. But as we mentioned and we spoke about earlier, it's the energy. That's the big one. You know, we're trying to feed these soil microbes and provide them with as much energy as we can so they can be as active as possible within the soil. They can multiply. They can break down organic matter. They can cycle nutrients. They can interact with the roots. The more energy we can provide and supply the microbes, the more active they will be, the greater number of microbes we will have. Um, the better off and the more resilient our soil will be in the long term. So that energy figure um, is, is, for me, probably the biggest one. Um, but it's very, very difficult to put a value on, on that energy. So what we've done is this, the, the data that we're looking at here now is taken from two heaps on farm, a little trial that we did uh, in the UK this year, and we got the same muck that came out of the same shed and we split it into two halves we created a field heap and we created a bakashi heap and there's an awful lot of data but the key point that i want to raise here is is i put a value to the n p and k retained in those materials bakashi compared to to a field heap of stacked fym so the field heap of stacked farmyard manure had just over 30 kilograms per tonne of dry matter in nitrogen, which when you take the fertilizer values from AHDB for March 2020, equated to roughly 75 pounds worth of nitrogen. Phosphorus using the same method, kilograms per tonne dry matter was 15 pounds nearly, and potassium was just over 50, giving us a total value of 141 pounds in N, P, and K. The Bokashi, again, same starting material, just handled and managed differently, had a little bit more nitrogen, a little bit more phosphorus, and just a fraction less potassium. The total value of that worked out to be 12 pounds and four pence greater than that of the stacked farmyard manure. So we know that we're keeping hold of more nutrients, Obviously, the value of those nutrients is, is far greater than it usually is at the moment. Um, but to give you an example of, of the costs involved, that £12 additional N, P and K cost the farmer £6 in materials and labour. So he's effectively doubled his money from the costs involved of, of making this. But as I mentioned just a second ago, is the biggest value is the increase in energy. And unfortunately, we can't put a price on that energy. Uh, that retention of energy is not a figure that we have. And the same goes for carbon. You've got an awful lot more, over twice the amount of carbon left in the Bokashi compared to the, the traditional composting. 
uh, but we can't put a value on that carbon. So when we do finally get a value for carbon, that figure of 12 pounds and four pence will be far, far greater because there are a lot more nutrients. We just haven't been able to put a price on them yet. So that's all very well and good, but what does it do when we apply it onto the soil? So again, we looked at doing a, a long-term trial and this one was done over three years. And we had three plots with many, many repeats so we could get a really good average. And what we found is that when we were growing winter wheat, followed by winter wheat, followed by winter wheat for three years, and we looked at the organic manure amendments onto three different plots, we had a control that had nothing. We had the compost, which was a traditional aerobically turned compost material. And then we had the bakashi was applied three years running to the same plots in the same fields in the same areas. And we saw a significant increase in organic matter above the control. So the control after three years was 4.6% organic matter in the soils. The compost, 4.7%. Bakashi jumped to 5.2%. And this was winter wheat followed by winter wheat followed by winter wheat. And um, this is fairly typical of what we see. Um, you might not necessarily achieve five point, uh, uh, such a significant increase. So it all depends on your starting point and the soils. Um, but we do see an increase in organic matter. Because you're keeping hold of more organic matter, you've got more organic matter to apply onto the soil. So it makes sense that we're seeing an increase in the organic matter percentages of our soils. And if you were to combine the application of Bokashi with cover cropping, uh, min-till, uh, the introduction of livestock, legumes, and other sort of uh, practices, then you can increase your organic matter in your soils you know, really significantly, really quite quickly. Um, we would always suggest three years is a good, is the minimum time you need to do to use to make these changes to see results you might not necessarily see results after one year you might in two years but by the third year you you'll see a difference you'll notice a difference uh, and it will become significant looking at nitrogen again it's the the one element if you will that all farmers can relate to and, and are interested in in this instance we saw far greater available nitrogen as well as stock nitrogen from the Bokashi applied plots. Uh, the interesting thing and the question that I always get asked on this is regarding the available nitrogen from compost. It's always lower, always, and it will always be lower. And the reason being is that you're applying a material to the soil that's lost all of its energy. It's quite, it's fibrous, it's woody, um, you know, it looks very much like soil, but it's usually the, tough to break down carbon that's left. All the readily available energy has long since gone when that heat was generated. So what you're left with is hard to break down, woody, fibrous material. And for the soil microbes to be able to break down that material, they need to pinch nitrogen from your soil. And that's because the way in which microbes work, they need a balanced diet of both carbon and nitrogen. So if you're providing them some really tough to break down carbon, they're gonna be pinching nitrogen from your soils to try and achieve that breakdown. Whereas if you're providing the microbes, something like the cashew, you're providing them the energy, the nitrogen, the carbon, it's a more balanced diet. So you're not taking anything away from the soil. In fact, you're actually adding to it. So we typically see you know, an increase in, in both N, P, as well as K over a period of time. Now that's all well and good, obviously, you know, the soil analysis shows that we've got more nitrogen. How does that equate when we look at yields or potential yields? Now, again, this was the same trial done with the same material over the same three years, and it was winter wheat followed by winter wheat followed by winter wheat. And we can see that there wasn't any scientifically significant differences in the yields that we returned. Obviously, the first year we had the best yield with, with just over 10 tonnes, um, but it dropped every year thereafter, winter wheat, probably winter wheat. I don't think the growing conditions were quite so good in 15. Um, but what we did see when we averaged that out over the three years is that Bokashi did yield a little bit better. So we were seeing a positive trend, and that positive trend showed that the yields were 
increasing and the distance between the Bokashi and the control and the Bokashi and the compost was increasing. So we saw a positive trend and that just reaffirms that, that there's nothing you can do today that's going to have effect tomorrow. You've got to, to consider this a long-term project. You've got to make small progress year on year. If you try and do it all in one year, it's just not going to work. You're not going to see the results. So it's something that needs to be done over a period of time. But between three and five years, that's when you're going to notice a difference. And that's when you're going to see the benefits and reap the rewards of the hard work that, that you've been doing. And we see that time and time again from the, from the trial data. So that's a little bit about how uh, the, the nutrients look, um, the benefits of the Bokashi process. Um, we'll look now a little bit as to, to what we can do and how we can make it and how we can potentially fit that into your farming system and whether it's something that's gonna be of benefit to you. So there are a few rules involved with, with making Bokashi and they're quite simple. You need a carbon to nitrogen ratio of roughly 24 to one. And that's again, coming back to that balanced diet. Microbes to be able to break down organic matter and to ferment it effectively need 24 parts of carbon and one part of nitrogen. That's the perfect balanced diet for microbes. If you've got too much carbon and not enough nitrogen, so for those that are really, really generous with the straw in the bedding, or are adding wood chip into that bedding where you're gonna have a high carbon content and potentially low nitrogen. Lambing pens could potentially be the same. You want to use lots of straw, keep that environment clean and dry. You're gonna have less muck. Um, you're gonna have less nitrogen. So you've got to consider that carbon to nitrogen ratio. But if you can achieve anywhere between 15 to one and 30 to one, you're gonna achieve a pretty good result. You might even be able to go 35 to one. Um, you'll be able to achieve a good result, but just bear in mind that there might be a few pockets of straw, heavy carbon areas that might not be broken down as much as the rest of it. In regards to dry matter, we're looking at between 20 and 40% dry matter. Again, it's ish, it's not an exact science. If it's 15% dry matter, you're gonna be okay. If it's 45, 50% dry matter, you'll probably be okay as well. But that moisture is important because that moisture is what microbes use to move around. That's their transport. So if you've got a really big heap and you've not spread those microbes through that heap evenly, you could potentially end up with little pockets within that uh, heap that haven't fully fermented and broken down as you would like. So that moisture is quite important. I would suggest that you can never add too much. When you've added too much, you've probably got slurry. So as long as it's still standing and stackable, um, you could probably add a little bit more moisture. So, so don't be afraid to add moisture. And what I generally talk to and tell farmers that they, they could do is to make the heap like we've got in this picture here and leave it outside and leave it outside for a couple of days in the rain. That moisture will work its way into that heap. Um, and then cover it later. So just a little touch on, on the carbon to nitrogen ratio, just to give you a bit of an indication, and, and this is a question we get quite commonly, is, well, what I've got this material, I've got wood chip, or I've got straw, or I've got lawn clippings, or green waste from my garden. What's the CN ratio? General rule is greens and browns. So browns are higher in carbon, greens, um, higher in nitrogen with the exception of slurry uh, which is very brown uh, but also quite high in nitrogen so straw roughly has a, has a cn ratio of 80 to 1 slurry as an example has a ratio of roughly 8 to 1 depending on the type of slurry wood chip which is a common one and a common bedding source would have a cn ratio of between 300 and 400 to 1 so it's really really carbon heavy You've just got to try and balance those. You'll never get it spot on, so don't worry about it too much. You just want a good mix of greens, browns, carbon, and nitrogen. So we've got a carbon, we've got a nitrogen, we've got the moisture content. Um, you know, it's all, all near enough, uh, and near enough is good enough if, if you're from Cornwall like me, usually. Um, what we will see then is you need to add the amendments. So one meter cubed of organic matter, 
will require two liters of ActiFerm. ActiFerm being those microbes, those microorganisms. You also need 10 kilograms of a gear seashell that acts as a pH buffer to prevent the lactic acid bacteria from dominating, the pH dropping too low. Um, you end up with a pickling effect rather than the breakdown if the pH drops too low. And then we also suggest 10 kilograms of clay minerals. This is optional, but the clay minerals act as a nutrient binder. And given the part of the world that we're in, generally most soils have good clay content. Um, and it might be worth just adding a little bit of soil to the heap and that will bind the nutrients together. So any of those nutrients that are released by those microbes can be bound to and retained within that organic matter. This process is the most labor intensive, the most fussy and the most expensive way of making Bokashi. Um, I believe this was the way in which Ewan made it within reason. I don't think he used the clay minerals, but the microbes and the seashells were, were used. Um, there are alternative ways of making it, and um, they are much easier and cheaper and better. But just on a little bit of a side note, anybody that is going to Groundswell or has been to Groundswell may well have seen a Bokashi heap. And this, these pictures were taken from last year's Bokashi heap that we made for Groundswell show. And you can see there that we layered the amendments through the heap. We effectively made a giant Bokashi lasagna. And that's to ensure that the microbes are able to make their way through the heap and they've got the pH amendments um, and the clay minerals close by so we can can, can ensure an effective fermentation. We have just recently made the Bokashi heap for this year's grounds well, so anybody that wants to go and have a look can, can really get their hands dirty and have a feel at what's happened to that breakdown. But the alternative methods of making a Bokashi heap, um, you can see the picture on the left and the right here, there are guys that are spraying microbes directly onto the bedding during the housed period. This is the cheapest way, it's the easiest way, and it comes with the most benefits. People that are doing this generally use less straw. Uh, they reduce the ammonia smell within the shed. And if you can smell ammonia, you're losing nitrogen. So they're keeping hold of more nitrogen in the bedding as well. They're also seeing a reduction in, in disease pressure. So things like ringworm, for example, a farmer phoned me up recently and said, I use your microbes really good. Didn't, shed didn't smell quite so much, but the biggest difference was None of my calves had ringworm this year, not a single one. Uh, and he didn't realize that the, the benefits of the microbes went beyond just retaining those, those nutrients and fermenting the organic matter. So there are health benefits as well. It's extremely effective for things like watery mouth in lambing pens, for example, um, foot rot, those sorts of things. So there are additional benefits to applying those microbes into that housing period, but it's also a significantly cheaper way of doing it. Uh, and it's also a lot easier. In the middle, this was a, a farmer at the Clinton Devon Estates that made a Bokashi heap last year, um, so South Devon, and he turned his cows out and he applied the microbes, the seashell, and he applied his own source of clay onto the bedding before he took it out with the tractor. So the process of taking that muck out with the tractor, the front end loader, mixed everything through sufficiently to ensure that the microbes and the fermentation would be a really, really good and successful uh, end result. So once you've applied the microbes or the amendments, depending on whether you're doing it during the house period or post housing after the animals have gone out, the next step is the same. You need to effectively make a silage clamp with your farmyard manure. So this means putting it into a heap and covering it. Now, most people will make a heap in the corner of a field or in the corner of a yard and put a plastic sheet over the top and cover it. If you're super keen, like they are in the Netherlands and like the farmer was in the top left-hand picture um, in, in Essex, he was based, you can put it through an ag bag machine, which is quite an effective way of, of ensuring that anaerobic environment. All processes work, whichever sort of choice you choose. Um, the key is that you get that heap covered. That will prevent rain from washing away soluble nutrients, which means you reduce the amount of, of leaching you have um, and the amount of effluent runoff you have. But it also creates that anaerobic environment, which ensures that the microbes are working via fermentation 
rather than the traditional aerobic breakdown, which would be rotting. So we're fermenting, retaining those nutrients. So that cover is important uh, for a number of different reasons. And the main question we get asked is, do I have to put the plastic sheet on? And my reply is always the same. If you want to do a good job, yes, you can get away with it, but you're not going to do as good a job. It's going to be less effective. You're not going to have the same results. So it is absolutely worth your time, effort and energy to use last year's silage sheet uh, for this year's muck heap would be my suggestion. So once you've got it in a heap, once it's been stored, once it's been covered and left, you need to leave it a minimum of eight weeks and then you can apply it. The longer you leave it, the better it is. It's a little bit like a fine wine. So don't be afraid to leave it eight months. If you don't need to use it, don't use it. That's the, it's quite simple really. Only use it when you need to, but give it a minimum of eight weeks. And at that point, so at after eight weeks, we've got a stable product which means that when you apply it onto the soil, it will be taken into the soil and those nutrients will be used before they're lost. So we have something called secondary fermentation, which was when we experienced those losses. So there's no point retaining the nutrients to then lose them when we apply them later, which is why you need to leave it a minimum of eight weeks to create that stable product. But as I said, if you don't need to use it for eight months, please don't. You know, the longer you leave it, the better it is. And what we would typically expect to see is if you were to apply this onto grassland, you would see that the, the, the muck, the dung, the FYM, the ferment, the cashew ferment would have been broken down and disappeared within about three weeks. And we know this because we've got people that are applying it between cuts of silage with no contamination you know, six weeks later when they come in and take that second cut of silage. So that breakdown and the incorporation time is really, really quite quick, um, which means we've got more options when it comes to applying onto grassland in spring. Um, if the farming rules in farming rules for water say that we absolutely cannot apply in the autumn. So an awful lot of talking. I've run over on time a little bit. I appreciate that. Um, so what I'm going to do is round off with a really quick recap. And, and it is, is quite simple. Bokashi fermentation will retain more nutrients, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, all those nutrients, energy. And by doing so, you're reducing your emissions. And if you're reducing your emissions, you're reducing your pollution. By feeding the soil, you're increasing the soil organic matter. You're providing it with a, a pre-digested food, which means that those nutrients are available. You're gonna be feeding the earthworms, the beetles, the nematodes. That whole soil food web is going to benefit because you're providing a better quality food stuff for them. And it can be ready in as little as eight weeks. So it's, it's a really quick turnaround. And, and hopefully uh, I've explained it well enough that you can understand the benefits and, and appreciate why I say it's very much like compost, only a little bit better. So that's me, I'm done. Uh, I've taken up more than enough of your time. Um, I personally wanted to thank you and obviously for, for getting me involved uh, and the Devon Wildlife Trust for having me today. Um, you know, Devon Wildlife Trust is actually something that I am personally a member of um, and, and see value in. And, and I know the work that Ewan's doing behind the scenes and, and in regards to the North Devon Natural Solutions project that they're running. So if you're not aware, go and have a look, check it out. Um, and also, if you've got any questions regarding what we've spoken about today or you think of questions later on, um, Ewan is a good, good person to contact. If not, you can always have a look at our website. So I think that's enough from me. Thank you very much. Ewan's back in. I've not uh, not put him to sleep. So that's good news. Um, so I'll pass back to, to you. Great. Uh, thanks, Andrew. That was, uh, that was, I have unmuted myself. I tend not to, yeah. Um, that was really interesting. Thanks very much for that. Um, just running through a few of the questions then that have come through. Uh, on the making side of, uh, of obviously going, going through the cash system, uh, the two fronts, spraying the bedding throughout the winter which didn't seem to be adding the amendments do you need to add them using this method that's a really really good point and probably something that i should have included you don't need to so that the seashell grit acts as a ph buffer if you're applying the microbes through that housing period 
you've got fresh muck coming out the back of the animals, but you've also got fresh straw. And the application, the regular application of both of those acts as a pH buffer. So you don't need the seashell grit. Um, and the clay minerals act as a nutrient binder. Well, if it's in the shed, those nutrients that could potentially be released in the form of effluent can't go anywhere unless you're on the side of a hill and it's all the angles are wrong. You're not going to lose those nutrients. So you don't need the clay minerals. You don't need the seashell. You just need the microbes, um, which makes it cheaper, easier and better all round. So it's, it's not needed and it's well worth doing it and making it that way if you can. Cool. Thank you. Uh, here's an interesting one. It must be a dairy farmer in here. Does it break down TB and Yoni's contamination? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, um, no. So it's, it's, the microbes are extremely effective against any sort of bacterial um, or fungal infection. But there are a few that are really quite tough and stubborn. So E. coli mastitis, um, we can absolutely have an, uh, have an effect and prevent that. Um, like I said, uh, watery mouth, uh, ringworm, foot rot. Um, there's a lot of benefits we can have, but unfortunately, yofis uh, and TB is not something that we can, these microbes are not going to be able to touch. And that's just because they're too, too damn resilient. Yeah, well, I suppose that's why we have so many problems with them, isn't it? Yeah. Um, how does the Bakashi method reduce runoff? So the, the main cause of runoff is the rain that's falling onto a muck heap. So every material, you know, and they'll know this from, so from silage heaps, there will always be a little bit of runoff. As that material settles, as you push it down and squash it, you're going to have a little bit of runoff. Um, but if it's then being rained on as well, you're going to increase that runoff significantly, not only the effluent that comes out of the material, but also that rainwater as well. So if you're covering it straight away, you're reducing that runoff massively. Uh, when we go to grounds well, we always put a plastic sheet underneath the heap. And from 10 tonnes then of, of farmyard manure, we usually get maybe 20 litres of, of effluent. So not very much. Whereas if that same 10 tonnes had been left out to be rained on all winter, we'd be looking at over 200 litres of effluent. So it's, there will still be some, but it is significantly reduced and it's mainly because of the rain that's no longer falling on that heap. Okay, and how often do you need to spray the bedding through winter? This is what I often ask, I think. <laughs> Once a week. So what I would say is if you know, well, you will know how many bales of straw you're using per week for that particular animal housing. So if you're using uh, 10 tons of straw, you need to apply 20 liters of microbes, but you can do it in one application. So you don't need to do that every time you add straw because those microbes will be able to move around a little bit. Um, but I would do it once a week, once every 10 days sort of maximum. Um, so it's a weekly application and there are a few farmers, uh, I, I'll call them lazy farmers and, and hope that none of them are on this webinar that don't want to walk through or, or their workmen don't want to walk through the shed and apply the microbes onto the bedding. So they pour the microbes onto the bale before they put the bale through the straw chopper. Uh, so it saves an application, it's a little bit quicker and easier for them uh, and I, I get it. And the results are still very good. So it is, is another option for you if you wanted to. Um, and this one's more, more for me, actually. How about applying to, for instance, the hay or silage so it goes through? So interesting. So the microorganisms that we're using are not feed approved. So you cannot apply them directly onto the food. We've, we've, they have no negative effect. They're not going to cause a problem. They're not going to poison your animals. They're just not feed approved. So you've got to be a little bit careful. Okay. Uh, the watering, so the application of the of the EM, is it essential? I think that sort of the, the weekly watering is it essential. And from what you've said, it, it's sort of not really. You can do it, or you do it like what what I did, which was spread it all at the end, chuck it all on at the end, which isn't the ideal, yeah. obviously. Yeah, no, I would try and encourage farmers to do it once a week, but there's always going to be a busy week and they don't get to it. So if you miss the odd week, it's not going to be a problem. Um, 
but it, like anything, if it becomes habit and it becomes routine, it's going to get done. And I think that's the key point is try and fit it into a routine. So if your big day of, of bedding up the animals is on a Monday, for example, then, then make it part of that routine. Or if you know you've got a quiet day on a Thursday and it's easy to do then, make sure it's done on a Thursday and becomes part of that routine. Um, but if you don't do it during the house period, you can still make the bakashi at the end, but just bear in mind that there will be additional costs um, and it might be a little bit more expensive than it would be if you just use those microbes. Uh, this is an interesting one. Does the process kill off dock seeds and buttercup? Haha, <laughs> a really good question. And in a simple word, yes. Well, in a word, no, it doesn't kill the weed seeds. Um, what happens is the environment within that Bokashi heap um, provides an environment that the weed seeds can germinate. So those weed seeds will germinate and they'll go searching for sunlight or oxygen and, and they'll die off. And that's really interesting what we see and to, to prove that because everybody looks at me and say, oh, yeah, that's just sort of your answer for everything. Um, is instead of putting a black plastic sheet over the heap, put a clear one like cling film over the heap. So you've got sunlight and what you'll see is underneath that sheet where the weed seeds um, have germinated, you'll see plants starting to grow because they've got access to sunlight. So we can see and we do see that we have less weed seeds than we do with just standard stacked FYM. So dock seeds, thistles, any type of seed will be will germinate within a bakashi heap uh, and then die off. So it's not going to have any or increased weed burden when you come to apply it later on. Okay, great. Um, and that would happen within the eight week period as well, would it? Yeah. 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 So as soon as you take it out of the shed and farmers will notice this, if they turn the cows out today and they go back in two weeks later, they'll see little shoots of wheat or barley popping up and growing from that muck heap. Um, that's fairly typical from farmyard manure that's been left for a period of time. So the process of then taking that out, putting it into a heap within eight weeks, you won't have any weed seeds left whatsoever. Okay, great. Um, how would you recommend dealing with wood chip? Wood chip's always tough, really tough. Uh, I had a conversation this morning with, with somebody who's looking at doing it, and he said, well, I've got a load of pine wood chip. Can I add that into it? Now, some wood chip, yes. Uh, pine wood chip and evergreen wood chip contains uh, a resin which is antimicrobial. So the resin that the wood chip produces and releases resins, which specifically kill microbes. So absolutely do not use um, wood chip from evergreen trees. That's, that's not going to work. But if you've got other trees that are non evergreen, you can absolutely include them into a bakashi heap, but you've just got to be aware of that carbon to nitrogen ratio. So if you've just got loads and loads of wood chip and you've not got enough nitrogen, they're not going to break down. Okay. So it's, it's all about that balance. I would suggest adding some wood chip onto the bedding during that house period, um, little and often, you know, just a sprinkling here and there. So then you've got both the nitrogen and the carbon to break everything down. And that's the best and quickest way to speed up the breakdown of, of wood chip. Okay. Um, and is there a time of year that's generally better to do it or can it be done started year round? It sounds like just as often as possible, really. Yeah, the, most people, and, and I'm generalising, obviously, and every farm is different, so it's going to be different on every single farm that, that I would visit. Everybody does it slightly differently, but most people would apply the microbes onto the bedding, say the winter's six months long. They'll put the microbes onto the bedding, and at three months, they'll clean that bedding out. So the middle of the winter, they'll clean that bedding out, and they'll start again. Um, it was getting too high. They couldn't open the doorway. The, the muck was going into the water trough, for example. So they clean it out. They put it into a heap. So that would be in the depths of the winter that they're making their bakashi heap. Um, and then they go again. So they make the first one in the depths of the winter. They make the second one in the spring. Um, and there are people that are doing that all year round. So there's no best time to make a bakashi heap. It would be a case of whenever you're producing farmyard manure, make a bakashi 
and add those yeah. microbes. And I asked you this question when I first met you, um, is it Sword Association approved? <laughs> Uh, yes, it is. So all of the amendments, the microbes, the seashell, the clay minerals, they are all organic approved. Oh, that's that's changed since I spoke to you. Actually. <laughs> it has. We, we struggled to get um, uh, the seashell grit. Um, we struggled to get approved as um, organic. And the reason being is they thought that we were killing poor, helpless uh, sea animals to pinch their shells. Um, we're actually taking the shells from the food industry. So it's a byproduct uh, of, of the food industry. And once they understood that we weren't killing, we were just reusing and recycling, they were okay with that. Yeah, very much up their alley, isn't it? Um, yeah. Does uh, Bakashi make fields more resilient to topsoil loss during heavy rain? Yes. And, and the reason being is an increase in organic matter. Uh, it's as simple as that. You know, if you've got living roots, for example, you've got more to hold that soil together. But if you haven't got living roots, the only way in which you can do that would be to increase organic matter. It's not going to prevent it. If you've got bare soils over the winter period, so May stubble, for example, you're going to have some soil erosion. Um, the only way in which you can prevent it completely is probably to to, to get grass in behind some maize or, or some of your winter cereals to try and bind it together. But an increase in organic matter in your soils will help to keep hold of that soil and keep it in place, definitely. Great. Um, and how does it, can, or can it work with slurry as well as with FYM? It can, yeah. So slightly different process and we still experience a lot more losses with slurry. So we can add those microbes into the slurry and the microbes will work exactly the same way. They'll start fermenting that organic matter within the slurry. They'll be converting mineral nitrogen into organic nitrogen, which isn't lost through volatilization. So it's retained. We see an extra retention of, of additional nitrogen um, of about 15%. So we get 15% more nitrogen in treated slurry compared to non-treated slurry, which means there's more nitrogen available to apply. The biggest thing with slurry is, and the biggest losses that occur with, with slurry is in the cubicles. Um, there's a urease enzyme in the dung that reacts with the urea in the urine to release ammonia. So the best way of, of preventing those losses would be to include a carbon source and include microbes. So it would be a case of deep bedded um, houses with straw is going to be a lot more efficient at reducing emissions than cows on cubicles uh, and on a concrete passageways. You're always going to get more losses. So it does have an effect. It does work in the slurry system, um, but the benefits aren't quite as much. Yeah, great. Um, so obviously we've heard a lot of the good things that Bakashi does. So why isn't everyone doing it? What, 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 what are the barriers here? What are the drawbacks? The drawbacks, um, I think there aren't so many drawbacks. The drawbacks would be time. You know, you've got to apply the microbes onto the bedding or you've got to cover a muck heap. That's, that's the big one is, oh, we've got to cover it. Do I really need that plastic sheet? I don't want to be covering down a, a muck heap in the middle of winter. Um, so that's always a drawback. Um, the, the, the real, I suppose the reason why people aren't doing it more, and, and we've definitely seen huge increases in interest recently, um, but the reason is, it's a waste product. FYM is a waste product and we consider it and treat it as such. You know, food waste is another waste product. It contains an awful lot of nutrients. And as soon as we stop treating it like waste, we'll realize the value. You know, one ton of, of organic matter um, can have over a hundred pounds worth of, of NP and K nutrients. That's, that's significant. Mm. So it, it's absolutely worth, and it's a, it's a mindset change of, we need to put value on our organic manures. And when we start doing that, we'll start treating them a little bit better. Um, and, and that's the biggest mind change we're having at the moment. The price of nitrogen has helped. What can I do to keep hold of more nitrogen on my farm? The environmental pressures, you know, pollution, emissions, carbon footprinting, anything that you can do to reduce that carbon footprint on farm is also going to be beneficial. Um, and, and that's really the key point is until we start 
starting to think about and treat our organic news differently, um, we'll still experience those losses and we'll still have uh, the leaching and the, the volatilization of, of nutrients from our farm. Okay, great. And uh, I think final question. Um, how long do you think before you can put a, a price on the carbon saved? <laughs> Uh, a really good question, and um, I didn't hope somebody was asking it. Yeah, I suppose I hope somebody was asking it. I read a good book um, recently, and in there there's a quote, and I'm going to I'm going to repeat it. Was that um, no matter how great science is, it's still been unable to put a price on carbon, which in my mind makes it priceless. Uh, I wouldn't go quite so far as to say it's priceless. Um, but it's not far off. I think the carbon in the soils and, and increasing carbon in our soils is probably the single biggest change or, or benefit that we could have to our farm um, and to the wider environment. You know, if you, if you increase your organic matter by, by 1%, um, the amount of extra carbon that's been sequestered is, is huge. But also the amount of water that you can hold on to, the, the water... Um, uh, holding capacity of your soil from a 1% increase is something like 140,000 litres per hectare. So you can keep hold of an awful lot more water, which then means when it starts to dry up in the spring and into the summer months, that water is still there. So you're not going to have the same effects from drought and you're not going to be affected by heavy rainfall either, which means that, you know, I keep coming back to this word resilient. You're going to have more resilient soil and, and, it's tough to put a price on. I appreciate that. And at the moment, I would say it's worth whatever somebody's willing to pay. But I can guarantee you now that nobody's willing to pay the true value of, of carbon in the soils. And, and until, until we can put a figure on it and until science catches up, unfortunately, we're not going to have a price, um, which until then, I'm going to stick with it's priceless. Um, I sorry, I actually missed two. Zoe's just uh, giving me a prod. Um, could you recap on the changes caused to pH by this method? Yeah. So when you introduce microorganisms, just like a silage clamp, you are you might be using a silage additive, for example, or you might not. There are microbes present everywhere on everything. Every surface, everywhere in the world, contains microbes, with the exception of sterile environments like. Uh, operating theatres. Um, everywhere else there's microbes and there will always be a dominant microbe. So when we talk about making Bokashi, we're introducing about 80 different microbes in the Actifirm mix. Some of those microbes are lactic acid bacteria, some are phototrophic, yeasts, fungi, and actinomyces. If we put them all into the environment and left them to themselves, the lactic acid bacteria would dominate just like a silage clamp, the pH drops and we end up pickling. So the pH drops, we create a really acidic environment and nothing else can live, nothing else can survive. But we're trying to break down that straw, that lignin needs to be broken apart. And the only way in which we can do that is to ensure that the yeasts, the fungi, excuse me, the yeasts and the fungi and the actinomyces can maintain a presence. So by manipulating the pH, by maintaining it as, as close to neutral as we can, we can ensure that the yeasts and the fungi maintain a presence and that they can then break down that, that, those fibrous materials, that carbon source. Obviously, when we're treating it post-housing, so the cows have been turned out, we've got an awful lot of microbes in a single environment with no control over that pH whatsoever. So you have to add the seashell grit to try and control the pH. The common question I get asked is, well, can I just use lime instead to ma maintain that pH? In theory, yes, you can, because that's really good at maintaining a pH. But I would counter that by saying, where do we use lime on farm? We use it on cubicles and we use it on lambing pens to kill microbes so adding lime will change the ph but it changes it so dramatically that it actually kills microbes so it's not going to work in a bakashi heap um, so you need the seashell grit to maintain that neutral ph but as we we touched on if you apply the microbes into the housing during that house period you've got fresh dung being applied 
all the time and you've got fresh straw being added regularly so that those those two combination of those two will maintain a neutral ph it's not going to be seven but it's still going to be neutral enough that it allows the yeasts and the fungi and the actinomyces to maintain a presence and to be able to break down that organic manure so that that fibrous material within the organic yeah. manure okay and then right i think this really is the last one this time uh, how much does it cost so the microbes so if you're applying the microbes into the bedding during the house period for every one ton of straw that you use per week you need to apply two liters of microbes per week if you were to brew your own microbes it would cost you 90p a liter if you were to buy the microbes ready to use, it could cost you between £1.30 a litre and £2 a litre, depending on the quantity you buy. Most people would buy 250 litres, and that would do most people for a full winter, and it would cost them £350. And that would be the cost. If you were to then use, sorry, if you were then to, to have to use the seashell grit and the edisil clay, the, the clay minerals, the seashell grit is probably the same again, so it's double the price. And if you were to use the clay minerals, it would be double the price again. So the clay minerals are the most expensive part; they're fifty percent of the cost. The seashell, the seashell grit, is about twenty-five percent of the cost. Um, a ton of seashell grit. You ask me a question now: is three hundred and twenty pounds? I believe a ton of the clay minerals is. 520 pounds maybe i can't remember off the top of my head because it's like i said most people are just using the microbes and then it works out at, at probably just under two pounds a ton of straw going into the shed yeah. which by the by the time you've added the cow's dung or the the, the sheep's muck um that ton of straw is probably going to become close to two ton of of fym so you're looking at roughly rough figures about a pound for every ton of farmyard manure that you take out of out of the shed. Great. Okay. Well. I, um, All right. Yes. Thanks. That's a. <laughs> that's an, a, a I think a, a good a good one to end on. Um. So what was I to say is uh. Well, thank you, Andrew. Um. That was I. I feel really informative. Uh. And thanks everyone who, who who came along. I hope you got as much out of it as as I did. Um. Any farmers who are here, uh, who are based in northern Devon. Check out our website. We're offering, you know, uh, some, uh, our product's a really good one, offering really, you know, uh, on-farm targeted advice. Um, and uh, yeah, be great to hear from you.